Hey guys, John Faulkner here with Survival Dispatch, and we are live. So uh, today's conversation is going to be all about finding yourself in a get home situation. So if you got any questions with regards to uh, gear, bags, questions, comments, concerns with regards to get home, uh, feel free to leave them below and I'll get to as many as I can here. So I know a lot of you guys are, are just now clicking in like people like Michelle here from Arkansas. So welcome everybody. And uh, also as you're watching this video, uh, make sure you hit the notification icon so that you guys know and are notified whenever we do live so that you never miss out if you got any questions on the topics that we're discussing. So, uh, you know, as usual, we try to do a live every Thursday or Friday. And, uh, you know, today we had some questions uh, from our insiders. If you're not an insider, check out insider.survivaldispatch.com. Uh, we'll also leave links below to become an insider. It's uh, free for 14 days and you get tons of awesome information, including our monthly uh, Survival Dispatch Insider Magazine uh, PDF. So make sure you sign up for that as well. Hey, Travis, how's everything going out there? Uh, I hope it's not raining there like it is here right now. So, um, all right, so get home situation. You know, we, we talk about it all the time. Um, I think it's, you know, one of the things that it kind of gets confused at times with like a bug out situation. Um, I say one of the biggest differences is in a get home situation, um, you know the exact mileage because you know what your end destination is going to be. Now you can say that with regards to like a bug out situation if you had, you know, a, uh, a location that you were bugging out to. Um, but, you know, as a, as a get home you always know pretty much where you're going. Um, you know, if, you're, if your work is uh, 80, 100 miles away, you know that your bag should be prepared for 80 to 100 miles and it should accommodate everything that you're not going to be able to acquire on the way. So, you know, and, and it, it, it adjusts as well. So if you are, you know, say going 200 miles on vacation, your bag might adjust. Um, so, Let's just, uh, let's just kind of start off with, we got one question here. Um, what are you first assessing uh, if a get home situation were to happen? So, you know, that's the biggest thing is we never know exactly um, what might cause a get home situation. You know, some of the people in California in the recent weeks with the hurricanes and stuff, that could be a get home situation uh, just due to the fact that, you know, there were some bridges that were knocked out. You could find yourself having to walk. Um, you could find yourself in a situation where roads were just undrivable and the only way home is, is in order to, uh, in a, only way to get home is by walking and you could find yourself in that kind of situation. It could be an EMP situation. It could be uh, horrible weather like in Atlanta a couple years ago with the snow. So, you know, the first thing you have to assess is what event has happened. Um, you know, that's the first question you have to ask. What event just happened? Um, and then, you know, address exactly what is going to be needed for you to, to get home. Um, you know, and it's one of those things that uh, it, it can be different for, for a lot of people. You know, it can be like in, in Atlanta, kind of a freak winter storm, caught a lot of people on the road, you know, thousands of cars. There's like a parking lot on I-75. Uh, thousands of people trapped inside their cars because they just had no way of getting home um, or were ill prepared for it. So, you know, it's one of those things where you have to assess the situation. You have to assess um, your needs at that point. You know, it could be better to, to stay in your car for a little bit uh, and to gather a little bit more information. It could be better to, as soon as possible, get out and start putting miles down. Um, because what's going to really happen is, is over time, uh, the situation is going to change. As people start to catch on to what has happened, um, there could be more panic, which could lead to, to more issues. So, so that's the biggest thing. Um, all right, next question here. Uh, this was, uh, you find yourself on vacation, you're 300 miles from home and an EMP occurs. Uh, you're fairly well equipped to get home with a bag similar to what Morgan has in the Get Home series. Uh, how do you make the call whether or not to attempt the journey home or start a new life with the equipment that you have on you? It, it's a question that, you know, like I said in, in, the, in the last, that you have to assess where you're at. Um, you have to assess what you have to travel through in order to get home. And you have to assess what is at home. If, 
you know, in my opinion, if you're if you're a single guy that uh, has nothing at home, you live in a small apartment, you know, and you're 300 miles from home, it it might be a little bit easier for you, you know. If if it's just 300 miles of uh, nothingness, you know, if you're let's say 300 miles outside of Las Vegas, you know, there's not much from you to Las Vegas, um, you know exactly what you're going to tell. If you are, you know, in, let's say in the Northeast and you have to go through or around, you know, New York, DC, Philadelphia, Boston area, um, you know, huge metropolitan cities, if you'd have to do multiple cities like that, it could be extremely difficult. And it would really, you know, that, that kind of situation, uh, could potentially make me consider if I was going to to take off right then and there and try to try to get home, uh, because you could find yourself in in multiple scenarios of people panicking, people looting, uh, rioting, you know, things like that that you just are going to probably encounter because it just happens. Uh, it's it's you know it's sad to say it's the world we live in. Um, you look at stuff like the power going out in the uh, Miami airport, you know, a couple months ago, there was looting happening in the airport within like five minutes of the lights going out. So it's really just one of those things, um, you know, it's really just one of those things that you have to really consider exactly um, what the scenario is that you're going to have to go through. And then do you have the the tools, the equipment, and the ability, and the mindset, and the skills needed in order to do it. And then the third thing is, is what do you have at home? You know, I have a wife and a kid, so if I find myself 300 miles from home, I'm going to probably do every single thing I can uh, to get home, because I know that they would also be in need of me being home, uh, because it's that serious of a situation. So, you know, it's really assessing, um, it's really assessing exactly what uh, you find yourself in, but it's one of those things that it's a personal question that you have to have to answer yourself. My first response is I'm always going to try to make it home because home is where I have more resources. It's where I have more connections. It's where I have more friends, family. Um, so if this did turn to be, you know, like the question said, an EMP situation, if it's something that is going to be a long-term situation, um, I want to be home because I know there's family and friends that I rely on and that they rely on me. Um, if it's something like freak weather in Atlanta, you know, I'm going to try to give my wife a call and say, you know, hey, I, I might be a couple days, you know, but I know that the weather is only in the Georgia area. I'm going to Florida and it'll be fine after that. So, you know, that's kind of how, how I would assess it. Uh, Bobby Lynn from Pure Fire Tactical is watching. Hey, Bobby, I'm still noticing the burn marks that we put on our table a couple weeks ago. So thank you for that. Uh, so if you're in the need of uh, ferro rod fire starters and you're looking for the hottest freaking things ever, uh, I guarantee they will burn nice wooden tables like this within a couple of seconds without even trying. So Hey, Bobby, I love you. Um, all right, next question. Um, do you have an inch bag? So inch bag, uh, inch is an acronym for uh, I'm never coming home pretty much. So it's difficult, um, you know, an inch bag for me, I, I, I really don't have one because for me it would be a, a vehicle kit that would then turn into, you know, a larger bag like this. Um, you know, an inch bag is, something catastrophic has happened, you're leaving your home. The, you know, the biggest thing with an inch bag is the never coming home part. It, it's, it's hard because um, if you have a destination that you're going to, then it's, it's not really, you know, you're just taking everything that you possibly can with you to another destination. If you're just saying like, the crap has just hit the fan and I'm just going west. I have no real plan. I just know I can't stay here. Uh, I'm just going, it's really hard to pack the essentials to start a new life within a backpack. Uh, sure, we can find sustainability in a bag like this for many months, just like, you know, through hikers do, um, but they also have resupply subs all, all, the, all the way. So, um, you know, it's really hard to say this is all I would need ever um, to, 
you know, get going and, and to be able to start another life. So, you know, for me, it's all about the planning before an inch bag ever comes really into, into play there. So, um, Logan asks, uh, what are your top three items you would carry in a bug out bag? Yeah, bug out bag, get home bag. Um, I would say a, uh, you know, within a bag. Now, I'm going to take my personal carry uh, items out. So, I'm not going to include like a pistol or anything like that. Um, a water filter or a water filter system um, is, is a must. You know, if we're talking about a get home situation, a bug out situation, the first thing that is going to stop you, I'm going to say, are your feet having really good footwear. So that would be the first thing that I made sure that I had in my bag is good shoes, good socks, uh, good underwear, and stuff that I can move in if I got to put down a lot of miles. Second thing is water. Um, you know, we got to make sure that we don't get these out of sequence uh, because it doesn't matter if you have an AR with 10 mags on you. If you have no water, you're not going very far after a while and you really just have a boat anchor at that point. Um, so, you know, good shoes, good socks, good hiking equipment, um, water, and then, you know, I'd probably, um, it's not going to sound sexy, but guaranteed calories because that's what's going to keep you going. You know, if I could only have three items, I mean, I can, I can work to find some place to, to shelter up. Um, I can, you know, but I can't really improvise good footwear or good socks, you know, on the, on the roof. So I can, you know, I can potentially get purified water through, you know, starting a fire or something like that, or I can have a filter system that I know I have water and I can keep moving. Uh, and then the last is calories. Yeah, I could, I could stop, I could try to fish or hunt or, you know, uh, wild edibles, things like that, but nothing is guaranteed. If I have those three base items, I'm guaranteed I'm able to log miles. The rest of it, I'll cross it as I go. So, you know, for me, I, I'm a little bit different. I know a lot of people would say fire and shelter, um, those kind of things, you know, first of all, your shelter, your first line of shelter are the clothes that you're wearing. So you should be ready for whatever season and environment that you live in. Um, you know, as far as a fire goes, it, as long as it's not uber, uber cold uh, situation, it's not a mandatory thing that you would have to have as long as you have ability to filter water. So uh, for me, it'd be, you know, good shoes, uh, a good water filter and, and calories to keep my body going. I know, I know everybody says like, oh, you can go three weeks without food. Trust me, you don't want to go more than like two days. If you're logging huge miles, um, you're just not going to want to do it and your body's going to start to, to hate itself and you're going to stop. So, um, all right. Avoiding, Brad asked a question, avoiding uh, pinch points uh, or, or blockades, anything like that, um, like bridges, how do you plan on river crossings? So river crossings, um, you know, multiple ways of going about it. You can, uh, you can fashion rafts. So this is, this is one of my packs. This is a, a Kuban fiber pack from Z-Packs. Um, they make fantastic hiking stuff. This is what I do a lot of my hiking with. So Bags like this are, are actually waterproof from the, from the uh, material that it's made out of. So you can roll them up, get them tight, actually get a little buoyancy out of them. Uh, number two, a, a good way to cross a, a river crossing uh, would be you can use um, waterproof stuff sacks. You can roll them up. They'll hold water um, like a, uh, a lion seal bag. I, I believe that's what it's called. Uh, Nikki, Nikki will Nikki will comment. I think it's a lion seal bag. You can you can search them up on Amazon. They are a waterproof um, storage bag, pretty much, and they're made as like a liner. So if you have like a 40 liter pack, you could get a 40 liter bag liner, shove it in there, and you know number one, it's going to keep all your gear dry if you live in extremely wet weather. But you could pull that thing out, wrap it up, tighten it, and uh, and have some buoyancy. And that's really what you're going to be looking for. Your other two options are you can try to find some driftwood um, to, to help get you, you know, buoyant across the pond, or take the long way around. Keep walking that river until you find a, a shallow or a calm area and go across that way. So those are kind of the different options. Um, and you can kind of, you know, assess uh, which situation, um, which situation exactly is, is the best, you know, for you. So, um, 
so yeah, so uh, Laura asks, I uh, have a bag in my car. It's way too heavy. I figured I can pare it down. Uh, is that a bad idea? You know, this is the, um, this is the question that's asked a million times. Uh, it's spun 50 different ways. There's a camp of people that want to go with, I'd rather have it and not need it. I can always ditch it. Um, there's also the camp that I kind of fall in. And I'll tell you, I come from a, a minimalist, uh, you know, through hiker kind of approach where you can get by with, you know, a 10 or 15 pound pack. And, you know, the biggest thing is, is when we start talking about body weight and hiking, you never really want to exceed about 15, 20% really, 25 is the absolute max, um, as far as the weight of the backpack to your own body weight. You know, if you weigh uh, 160 pounds, you know, an 80 pound pack is going to destroy you. Um, you, you know, and, and you see a lot of people, they want to try to throw the kitchen sink because we try to prepare. Um, we try to prepare for every single situation. Uh, the what if this, what if that, what if this. Um, what you have to first start with within your bag, determine exactly how far you have to go, determine exactly. Um, what environmental situations you find yourself in. You know, if you find yourself in, in Michigan um, or Florida, places where we have tons of lakes, um, we don't have to carry as much water. If you find yourself in Arizona, Nevada, you know, Southern California, things like that, you gotta be prepared to carry a lot of water. That means you have to substitute other items. Uh, same with, you know, shelter, same with clothing as far as warm weather, cold weather. Um, but I come from the need of, I think everybody should take their pack. I think you should go hiking with it, go out into the woods, spend a couple days, go with your family, go, go make it a fun trip, um, but see how, how your body actually handles that pack. There's some times where, hey, a 50 pound pack, the dude is in shape, he's just killer beast, you know, he can just carry it and go for days and days and days. There's other times where, you know, you might have an old injury uh, you might be a little out of shape. You might just not be ready for it. And 10 or 15 pounds is all you can carry. So it starts coming to, you know, how do you scale a bag to what you need? Um, you look at your situation. Look at what you need. Look at your skill set as far as what you need. Redundancy items really add up to a lot of weight. You know, if you buy quality gear, you're probably never going to have an issue with it. You know, like there's if you carry a good water filter, like a Sawyer squeeze or something like that, you shouldn't have to carry more than one, you know, or you can go to a different fashion, like you carry a Sawyer filter, uh, but then go with water tablets. Now, water tablets don't taste the greatest, but they're very thin, very small, very lightweight, um, and it beats a whole lot, it's a whole lot lighter than carrying an extra filter. So, you know, you start talking about situations like that. Um, I'm under the encampment, though, that you want to try to keep it around that, you know, 10, 15 ish percent uh, of your body weight, um, but get out and try to put miles in it. And I think that's the biggest thing is, is a lot of people want to make a bag, they want to throw it in their car or throw it in their, in their closet and, and think that if one day comes, you know, they're just going to throw it on and, and take off. Where if you start really putting miles in with it, You'll, you'll determine real fast, like, okay, this is, just, this is just too heavy. I can't do it. And if the day were to come uh, that I needed this pack, I know I can't go far with it. You know? And if your best friend's house or your bug out location is, is you know, 50 miles away, or your work, your get home situation is 50 miles away, um, what does that bag look like and how, how can I make sure I can carry it? So I try to tell people every all the time, try to pare it down as, as much as possible as far as weight goes. So um, Randy asks, uh, what's a reasonable distance per day on foot? It's a really good question. And it's, it's all determined on um, elevation, terrain that, that you have to cover. I would say for the most part, you're going to probably look at that 20-ish mile a day. Now, um, you know, we've done videos on it before. And last November, I did a, a Go Ruck event, uh, did 52 miles in just over 17 hours with a 40 pound pack. Now, did I do 52 miles? I did 52 miles. Uh, the next day, I would have probably not wanted to do any miles, um, you know, and so that's what we have to judge. We can't just completely destroy ourselves. Like, 
if you got a, if you got uh, say 60 miles to go, trying to push out you know 50 miles in one day, it might make it to where the next day you cannot go 10 miles. So breaking that apart to maybe 30 and 30 would be a much better option. But I would say for most, you're looking at probably 20, 25 miles, um, and and that's a long day. You know you're going to probably walk in around two miles an hour or so. Um, so you start to do calculations. It's a long day and um, it's, it's really hard, you know, on the body. And that's why, you know, when we start talking about hiking, even people that hike, you know, all 2000 plus miles of the Appalachian Trail, it takes, it takes about a week or two to get your hiking legs under you. Uh, that's what we call hiking legs. And, and at that point, your, your body's used to uh, kind of the beating that you're putting it under, where, you know, if you're an everyday at a computer kind of person, your body's just not used to it. Joints are gonna get inflamed, muscles are gonna be super sore, tons of lactic acid you know, in your muscles, you're just not gonna feel uh, fantastic. And that's why I say calories and stuff are huge if you're talking more miles. Um, but you know, realistically, I would say 20-ish miles. The only reason why I would stretch it is if you're on that like verge of say 30 miles, and you think you can make it. So, so that's what I'd say. But I'd say right around the 20, 25 range, if it was something you had to do multiple days, that's how I would calculate it. Um, all right, AJ asks, what role would night vision play in a get home situation realistically? It's a great question. Um, night vision is something that, that I have a ton of experience with. Uh, I do a lot of hog hunting and training and stuff. I have multiple uh, PBS 14s and dual tubes. Um, usually, I in, in in one of my other bags, I do carry a PBS 14. Um, it's one of those things where it's a huge advantage if you have it. Now, with a PBS 14, though, in a PBS 14, if you don't know, it's just a small, you know, one eye monocular, um, which I say would, would be kind of the most common night vision that's out on the market today. Um, you have to have headgear to go with it. If we're talking about using it, utilizing it as something that we're going to use, we're going to you know sleep during the day, walk at night. Um, I like that that scenario, that thinking. Um, nighttime. Listen, we are not a nocturnal uh, group of people. We are just not a nocturnal society, and it's one of those things where when the lights go down, people usually go away. Um, you know, they hole up, they rest, they sleep. So it is a fantastic time, you know, to, to avoid people. Now, most of the time, uh, if, you, if you give yourself the chance to get use, get your, let your eyes dilate, your pupils, you know, get set, um, you can see pretty decent at night. If there's any type of, of moonlight, you know, coming through, you, you can see enough to move. Uh, now, the big difference is, is if you're talking just walking down a road, we can pretty much do that with no night vision at all. You could just, you know, you could walk the yellow line and pretty much never have an issue. If you're talking about like, we're going to go, you know, cutting through trees, through forest all day long, that can start to get a little sketchy just due to the fact that, you know, catch a branch in the eye, a nose, cuts, things like that. Um, also, you know, holes, potholes, sticks, and, and things you could trip over and injure yourself. Um, but the biggest thing with a PBS 14 is you have to, if you're going to talk about using it, you know, while walking, um, you need a, some sort of headgear. And so that's going to start to take up a little bit more size um, because it, 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 can, it can really slow you down if you're constantly bringing it up or trying to hold it up uh, or bringing it down because the light that comes into your eye will also cause your eye to, to dilate again. So when you take it down, then your eyes are going to be darker, so it's going to be harder to see. Um, it can be a huge advantage. Anybody that has night vision against anybody that doesn't, it's, it's a force multiplier. Um, but it is something that takes batteries. It is something that, you know, also, you know, like I said, takes headgear. Um, I like to have it, if you can afford it, I like to have it in a bag. I would say it's lower on a, on a priority list. Make sure you get a lot of your other staples done first. Um, but, you know, it is a huge advantage uh, to have it in, in a bag like that. So, um, so, yeah, so, I mean, that's kind of my thoughts on, on night vision. Um, I prefer to have it, but I don't think it's a necessity. So I hope that answers your question. If not, then put it back up there. So, um, 
what do you recommend? Keith wants to know, what do you recommend to waterproof your pack? Um, so you can use a pack liner. Uh, I, I prefer to use a actual pack cover. You can find them from pretty much any company. Um, most companies out there, I mean like Gregory and Osprey, uh, Z packs, they all make pack covers. Pack covers, you know, will keep the, so like if you have a vertex bag like this, um, this has a, uh, uh, a water repellent, I can't remember what it's called right now, uh, DWP, whatever it is. Um, it has a little bit of water repellent built into the fabric, okay? So if I poured a little bit of water on this right now, it would kind of bead off, shed off. Um, but once this fabric soaks through, it'll stay wet for quite a while. So if I had a pack cover on the inside, uh, a liner on the inside of this, yeah, it's going to keep everything in there dry, but the bag's going to get a little bit heavier, um, and it's going to take a while to dry out. Where a pack cover is going to keep this thing uh, mostly dry. I'm not going to say 100%, but mostly dry from that ever happening. So I prefer to go with a pack cover, um, but pack liners are also great because you, you have a little bit more uh, assurance, you know, insurance on the inside of keeping all your stuff uh, dry. So, um, all right, Paul asks, uh, in case you have a town city uh, on your way back home, uh, would you go through it or find a way around it? I, you know, I always choose to, number one, make sure when you take off, if it's to work, if it's on vacation, whatever, you've mapped out your route, you know exactly, you know, what towns, what cities you go through, and then kind of do just, just like, like a little bit of research, you know, how big is the city, what's the population like, um, you know, as you're driving through it, like if you're going to vacation and then coming home, as you're driving through it, kind of, you know, take, take some mental pictures, mental notes, um, you know, what kind of town does it look like? What's, you know, hey, that side of town looks really run down, um, or that side of town looks really nice, really uppity, you know, kind of thing. You got to make these kind of mental notes as, and, and you don't even have to be mental notes. You can, you can write this stuff down. Uh, Nikki, Nikki's down here, you know, videoing and, and adding questions, but we travel to North Georgia, every couple of months and Nikki and I have a have a Garmin unit and we got you know water holes marked out we got friends locations that mar mapped on there so that if something were to happen um, we can make the decision like hey it's 25 miles you know to, to take a, a loop around this city um, but we have a friend in the middle of it that could help us you know or something like that we have the information that we can make a better uh, we can make a better educated choice on what's the better route because, you know, if we're walking, 20 miles is 20 miles. That's adding another day. Do we have the water? Do we have the food? Do we have the energy? Um, but going straight through that city, you, you might look at the risks of, hey, are there, you know, potentially gangs, rioting, looting? Um, do I just want to avoid people, period, you know? So these are the kind of questions that you have to ask yourself. That's why I always say, you know, make mental notes um, and, and go from there. So, so yeah, it's a fantastic question and it is a hard question. And I think that's one of the things with, we, we, wanna, we wanna rely on the bag. What is the bag? What's on the bag? But a lot of a get home situation comes from the six inches between your ears because you have to make a lot of decisions. You know, you have to determine, um, hey, is it worth me going 10 miles out of the way to a known water spot that I've marked on a map, or do I keep walking, save myself 10 miles, and hope that I come across water? Um, so, you know, things like that, you really have to um, try to get as much information as possible so you don't have to make educated guesses. Uh, I, that's the, the best thing I would say. And, you know, things like a GPS, your cell phone, um, map in, in, a, uh, in a marker are, are fantastic pieces that should be integrated into it as well just for that reason. So, um, all right, what are some good Faraday bags that you trust? So, uh, Faraday bags, yes, I use them. Yes, they're in my bag. Uh, Nikki has them in, in his bag also. This is Nikki's bag. Uh, this is one of my bigger bags, just kind of showing some size comparison differences. Um, Faraday bags, Survive Tech bags. It's a, it's a bag that, that we actually helped uh, put together and engineer. They've been tested um, to the nth degree. They have tons of reliability. They're a fantastic price. Nikki will leave a link 
to, so that you can get them. They're in the comments now. Um, but it's Survive Tech, T-E-K, um, and uh, they're fantastic bags. They come in two. There's a smaller bag that's really good for handling, you know, holding like one or two radios in it, a small bag that you can throw in your bag. And then there's a larger bag that come in a kit. Um, they're 50 bucks for the small and the large. The large bag is fantastic if you got, you know, tons of electronics that you want to put in, uh, keep it in your house kind of thing. So you can check, check those out. Um, all right. Do, 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 do. Um, are there any handheld radios that have a 30 mile radius? Bonnie is wanting to know. Nikki's going to help me answer this. It depends. Nikki says it depends. So, uh, Nick, Nikki is, is a radio guru. So, if I have to drag him up here, I will real quick. It, it's all going to depend. I'm going to answer it and then Nikki's going to tell me yes or no. Uh, it all depends on the amount of repeaters and stations and things like that that you're surrounded by. It also depends on your elevation. Uh, if you find yourself in a valley and you got to get up and over a hill, no. Uh, if you find yourself at the top of a hill and you're trying to get to another crest of another hill that's 30 miles away, you have a much better chance. Um, it also depends on, you know, like I said, repeaters. Hey, are there towers that you can kind of bounce your way, uh, you know, down the line like dominoes to to reach that 30 miles? Um, so you can also get a roll up and yeah. Uh, the antenna that you have is also going to make a huge difference. So if you have like a little stubby antenna on your radio, no. Uh, if you have like a long cord um, antenna, what do you call them? Line antenna? Like a roll antenna. A roll antenna. Uh, if you have like a roll antenna that you can throw way up into a tree with like a weighted line and pull it up, uh, it's going to get a much bigger distance. We just shot like a two-hour live video with Nick Meacher. Go back. Is that po that's posted? Yeah. Go back and check that. It, it'll answer every single radio question you might have. It was like two hours long. Um, so, um, okay. Uh, Savage Survival asks, uh, multi-use items are key. Absolutely. When paring down weight, when getting your bag size down, um, multi-use items are the key. You know, and, and it's one of those things, too, where I think a lot of times the situation is overlooked. Um, that you might have to you might have to move quickly you might have to be able to uh, get out of a place quickly get out of a hazard quickly um, so the more multi-use items we can have to get our pack a little bit lighter is going to allow us to move easier so absolutely savage survival multi-use items are a key um, make sure you have them in your pack try to fit them in there as much as possible um, are dog packs really an issue um, like packs you put on your dogs. Uh, I go hiking with my dog every now and then. She carries her own food and water bowl and things like that. Uh, I love it because, you know, it takes a couple pounds off of me. It puts it on her. Um, they do really well with it. If you're going to put a pack on your dog, if it's something, you know, you travel with your dog, make sure you train again with, don't leave like the pack in your car and hope that one day you're going to be in a bug out situation and put the pack on your dog. The dog is going to freak. They're probably going to hate it and it's going to make your life even harder. So, um, so yeah, uh, Donovan asked solar chargers. Uh, I, I believe heavily on solar chargers. Um, I carry probably more electronics than most people when it comes to, you know, um, my cell phone, keeping my cell phone going, my Garmin, uh, my PVS 14, um, flashlights, everything in my kit, we've done a video on that also, runs off of rechargeable batteries. Um, and it's, it's a system that I've put together over years. I know it works, but like right out front right here, um, like I didn't stage this or anything, is a Goal Zero uh, Nomad 7. So this literally sits on the outside of my pack so I can pull it out real quick. And I have it set up so that it has two uh, carabiners right on the top. So even if I'm moving, I just pull this thing out. I clip it to the back of my backpack. I'm collecting sun and I'm charging my external battery pack. So solar chargers are, uh, I think, and this is just going to be me. You, you can hate me in the comments. It's fine. I'm okay. Uh, solar chargers are a must because we live in a world where technology can make things easier. Now, can they all go away? Absolutely. And if they do, I'm okay with that. But until that day comes, use technology. Use your phone, use communication, get information, use maps, have satellite maps, topo maps. Um, the world is your oyster, you know? I mean, use the, use the technology until it's gone. Um, 
if you're under the impression that like, oh, you know, but you know, an EMP could go off and fry everything. This pack would be a whole lot harder to do a lot of skills without those tools. Now, can you do them? Yes, but there's no need to carry, you know, a flashlight. There's no need to carry a radio, a weather radio, a ham radio, uh, anything like that. So uh, solar chargers like this, um, Anchor makes really good solar chargers also. Um, Nikki, what's the company that starts with an R? Ray, uh, uh, I just bought another one. Renova? Uh, I don't know. He'll leave links. Uh, I'll get to it. I literally just bought another one. I could look on my Amazon account real quick, but uh, solar panel. It's like a single. I don't know. It, I'll, I'll post it in there. Uh, all right. Um, let's see here. We've got another question. Okay, going back to the Faraday bag. Uh, what is the point of a Faraday bag other than hiding your signal if post EMP phone systems uh, were all down? So, what is the point of a Faraday bag? Uh, other than that, you could have electronics in there, you know, that could potentially be damaged, um, like flashlights, um, you know. Now, if you're talking like all, all uh, antennas went down, cell phone towers, things like that, uh, we still have satellites in the sky that, that work. So if you had something, um, like in my pack, I have a Garmin InReach Mini. Uh, my wife has one at home, so we can still text no matter what. Uh, we can send texts, you know, back and forwards, relay information. So, you know, there's things like that, too, that you have to factor in. Uh, you know, any satellite phones would still, would still work if all the towers were out. Um, you know, so, so there are advantages to, to carry in a Faraday bag because, you know, and it might also be one of those things where, um, you find that it's just a small regional thing. You know, it's not, it's not an EMP, um, but it's something that happened that just knocked out a small area that your stuff is still safe, and when you got out of it, it all worked again. So, um, so different, different things like that. Um, Jeremy asks, what is the best source for topo maps? Um, hold on. It's a, uh, I got to remember the name of it. This is the app that I like to use the most. Um, it's G-A-I-A GPS. That's the app. So however, however you want to say that. G-A-I-A GPS. Um, that's, a, uh, that's an app that I like to use quite a bit. It can overlay different maps on it. So um, it has, but it has fantastic topo maps. Um, Check out base, map. base map is also another one that, that Nikki likes. I've used that one also. Um, but yeah, fantastic topo maps. And, and you know, topographic maps can they can save you, you know, being able to tell elevation differences uh, can really help, you know, avoid huge elevations that you don't have to go over for any reason. But I can also show you low valleys where there might be water, um, anything like that. So, so yeah, go check out those two apps. They're both, they're, I know they're both available for, for Android and for iPhone. So um, let's see here. Um, all right, got a question here. As far as cutting tools go, in the city, uh, knife laws suck. So what's a workaround to, to that? Um, you know, with regards to, to being able to carry uh, items like that, have them staged in your car. You know, you, it, it's the same with you might have an employer that says, hey, you cannot carry a firearm onto our building, into our building, onto our premise. Um, but, you know, you can have it in your car with your pack, um, you can, you know, you can always keep things hidden. I'm not telling you to break any laws, but keep things hidden. Um, you know, that is, that is a workaround. So, um, you know, and, or you have to improvise, you know, improvise, find pieces of metal, sharpen them, um, and, and go from there. It's not going to work nearly as well, but that's, you know, that's a workaround. So, um, all right. Sebastian asks, Hey guys, any recommendations for earthquakes? Um, don't live in California. Uh, uh, here's, here's the, okay, so Florida, every single year, you know, pretty much some point of Florida from, from tip to tip, we get hit by a hurricane. The advantage, we usually have a couple of days or even like a couple of weeks notice. So, you know, it makes life a little bit easier on us, even though when they get here, they're, they're usually pretty huge. Um, earthquakes are extremely difficult, number one. I don't think there's any way that you can actually predict a hurricane. I don't think there's any, any way that they can predict earthquakes. So they happen. So that's why we have to make sure we have bags ready to go that are easily accessible 
and closely accessible to us because we never know exactly what's going to happen. You could work in a skyscraper and your car is in a garage, you know, a block away because you work in a city and the garage is completely destroyed because of the earthquake. Um, now you don't have a bag. So the bag has to be close proximity to you, you know, at all times. It has to be in, in the house, in the car, or in your office. Um, you know, you have to keep it within, not arm's reach like we're paranoid, like, you know, you, you hold it like a bear at night or anything like that, but you have to, you have to keep it close by because that's going to give you your best options of having it when you need it. Um, you know, earthquake, I mean, I, I have to travel to California quite often, uh, and I was there like, a couple days before the last earthquake happened. And, and it's one of those things where as soon as I get there, as soon as I land, uh, I get my rental car and the first stop is I go get a, uh, like a 24 pack of water and I throw it in the rental car because I, I don't have, you know, a lot of connections that I can just go and, and get resources from. So I know as long as I have water, that's one less thing that I need, but I gather stuff as soon as I get there. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, so that's that. Um, let's see here. Um, all right, what type of fire making uh, tools would you carry in your get home bag other than a lighter? So a lighter is probably gonna be your first, you know, go-to option. Uh, a ferro rod, I would say, would be a second one because that gives you a, a long life tool, what I would say. You know, a lighter is gonna run out of fuel. A ferro rod's gonna give you, you know, thousands upon thousands of strikes. Um, so, like I said before, check out Pure Fire Tactical. Hands down, make the best ferro rods on the market. Uh, no questions asked. Um, you know, other things that I would consider in a get home bag um, would be like a, a Fresnel lens uh, because it's small, it's lightweight. As long as you have sun, you're always gonna be able to uh, to get a fire started with it. Also make sure that you carry things that will start a fire like trioxane, uh, fat wood, um, candles, things like that, you know, so that you guarantee you can get yourself a fire because you might not be able to find uh, dry wood, you know, if a storm came in or, or things like that. So, um, so I'd make sure, but yeah, a, a ferro rod, a Fresnel lens, uh, you know, a spark wheel could be something that'd be really good. Um, Kind of, kind of along that line. So, so yeah. Um, what was the most important thing you learned during uh, practicing a bug out? Um, so, when I did the Go Ruck event, I, I did it with a 40 pound pack. Uh, Nikki filmed it for us. Another guy in the office, Bert and I, did it, and um, it was one of those things where I did it as a, as a test. Um, it was all about can I, and, and I've hiked for a long time, but I've never, I've never done over 50 miles before uh, in a day. So it was, it was, can I put my body to the test? Will my body last for it? Uh, the biggest thing that I learned is, and I did a lot of preparation the months before this. So I, you know, I tried three, two or three different kinds of shoes. Um, I did, you know, 25 mile hikes um, to, to test those out. The biggest thing you're gonna learn when you do bug out, to, number one is how, 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 mu how much mileage can your feet endure? Uh, you're going to have to tape your feet. You're going to have blisters. You know, you're going to have situations with your feet, with chafing, um, that you're going to have to deal with. You know, and do you have what it takes? Do you have, you know, some moleskin or I like KT tape, um, just because it's a little bit thinner. It's a little bit more comfortable for me um, to take care of blisters. Do you have a blister kit in case you do get one? Do you have to, you know, drain a blister? patch it up, uh, neosporin to keep it from getting infected, things like that. But really, you know, the first thing that I learned about it was, hey, how much uh, suffering is my body willing to take before it stops? And that was what I really wanted to do. I have a, uh, uh, I'm doing an ultra marathon here coming up soon that, you know, is going to be the next step of how much suck can I take. So, so I'll bring you along that journey as well. The other thing is, is, hey, in practicing, you learn if your gear holds up, you know, is, is your backpack able to carry that amount of weight? Because I see a lot of people, they're trying to stretch a buck. I get it. We live lives. We have other things we have to do. We have bills. We have families. Um, they stretch a buck with their bag. It's a little bit cheaper. It starts to rip. Um, you also find out, is the pack comfortable? Do your shoulder, you know, are the shoulder pads comfortable? Is the waist belt comfortable? Does it fit you? Um, these are all things that, you know, 
your legs might feel fine, but if you have like raw spots on your back because the backpack doesn't fit you properly, that could slow you down also. And the last thing you would want in a get home or a bug out situation is an what I would consider an inside force. So things that you're in control of uh, to slow you down or to stop you. We, it's hard for us to predict what an outside force would be. Hey, a rogue gang that I have to you know, deal with. But an inside force like your bag, your clothes, your shoes, um, your preparation, that's all stuff that you can control. And those are the last things that you want to break on you. So, you know, there's a lot of things that you learn. And then take survival classes. Uh, go train with the great guys at, you know, Survival, uh, survival Co., American Survival Co., uh, .com. Uh, Matt and Joel and those guys have s amazing classes. Uh, Alan Kay's on here all the time. He does great classes. You know, there's classes and stuff that you can go take to learn the skills that you can then incorporate with the gear that you have in your pack also. Um, Lisa asks, what kind of sleep system do you suggest? Okay, so in my packs, um, I actually carry a, a tent. Um, it's a guaranteed shelter situation. Now, if you're in a city, listen, a, a situation that you're gonna probably be sleeping in is a dumpster, uh, is a alcove or an awning um, outside or behind of a building. You know, that's, that's a shelter. Um, so I carry a, uh, a Z-Pax pack, uh, Z-Pax shelter tent in my, in my pack always because it has a fully, fully enclosed uh, bug net and a bathtub. So a bathtub is just a floor. Um, so I know if it's raining, I can get out of the rain. If the bugs are atrocious, which they always hear, are here in the south, I can get out of the bugs and get a good night's sleep. Because if you don't get a good night's sleep, um, you're going you're gonna to start to just be miserable during the day. Your body is not going to want to function. Your body has to sleep. It has to heal. It has to recharge itself in order for you to keep going. And I think that's something that a lot of people overlook. They're like, I'm going to shove some leaves inside of a, of a trash bag, a compactor bag. I'm going to sleep on top of that. Dude, if you're cold, if you're wet, wet, if the bugs are just driving you nuts and you can't sleep, the next day you're just not going to have the ability to continue going. Um, so uh, I prefer to have a sleeping bag. Now, it'll change based on season. Uh, if we're talking winter season, I travel to Tennessee and stuff a lot, so I'll have probably a 20-degree bag or so. But I know no matter what, I can stay warm uh, in it. Now, you can also layer that with some clothing, and that gets me down into probably 10 degrees or so. Um, last, last November, I was in Tennessee, and it was like 14 degrees at night, and I was comfortable, and I slept. So, um, so I usually stick with a sleeping bag because I know it's guaranteed. Now, in the summer, it's hot here. All I keep is a sleeping pad and just an a, a inflatable mattress, uh, like a hiking mattress. I keep that in here. It's rolled up. It's, it's pretty small. And uh, all that does is just get me off the ground just so my back's a little bit more comfortable. I'm not laying on sticks or anything like that. And, uh, and that's all I'm going to use. Uh, you know, I'll just sleep in the clothes that I, that I have on. So, um, all right, next question here. So, all right, I'm trying to roll here. There's like so many questions coming in. This is crazy. This is awesome. You guys are amazing. So, um, all right, do you keep extra gas or fuel in your car for emergencies? If so, what is the method for keeping it uh, from expiring? Okay, first of all, make sure you're safe when you do this. Buy like jerry cans that are high quality. Um, you should be able to, if you're going to carry gas, like in a car, like in the back of a trunk, uh, I don't highly suggest it. I suggest, first of all, if you're traveling, when the gas meter hits uh, like half of a tank, pull over and fill it back up. Make sure you get as much mileage as you can always in the car. Uh, number two, Use quality containers. If you can smell gas, that means it's leaking, which means you can't use the can, period, uh, because the, the fumes are going to get inside your car. So, you know, in like the back of a truck with like a tonneau cover on it or something like that, if you use jerry cans and you can't smell them, um, you know, you're good to go. Now, as far as it expiring, gas expiring, two options. Uh, every month, take those cans out at the gas station. Put them into your car, your vehicle, your truck, whatever you want to call it, um, and then refill them. Or 
put fuel stabilizer in them. You can get it from like Pet Boys, Advanced Auto Parts, things like that. And it's literally just a liquid that you pour in there. Um, I use it at home with like a 55 gallon drum of gas. You just pour stabilizer in there. But like every couple of months, I'll just drive my truck around. I'll pump gas, you know, out of that 55 gallon into my truck and then I'll, repl I'll refill it, you know, so kind of keep it cycling. I'm not one of those guys that like, you know, put stabilizer in it, leave it there for a year and then like, you know, hope that it's good when you need it. So, um, so yeah, look at fuel stabilizers. You can get them at pretty much any place. You can probably even get it at like Walmart, uh, STP Amazon. and Amazon. Yeah, STP, you know, tons of companies make it, so. All right. Um, what do you carry with you in a bug out bag while you're over on an overseas trip? So uh, bug out bags get a lot smaller when you travel overseas. I used to have to travel to China and Thailand and stuff like that for another job that I had in a previous life. Um, they have to get smaller. And what you really have to do, Jace, is you have to augment your kit um, usually when you land. So if you're going on a trip to a, a foreign country for say two weeks, when I get there, uh, I try to find a gas station or something like that where like, hey, I can pick up a knife because they wouldn't allow me to, to carry any on the boat or on the plane or whatever. Uh, and I'll get myself a knife, a pocket knife, things like that. Um, you have to augment your kit when you get there. Same with like food or water if you're traveling on a plane. As soon as you get through TSA, gather some more items you know, that you have with you. Um, but bug out kits have to become smaller and uh, you have to make sure that you have things, you know, available to you. If you don't have a GPS, like get a local map when you get to whatever country you're going to. Uh, try to have things on your phone, like uh, 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 language translators, apps, and things like that, so that you can help, you know, more easily communicate with locals if you don't know the native language. Because you have to put yourself in the situation of, what are the things you're going to need first? And the first thing you might need is directions or communication with somebody. So if you don't speak the language, make sure you have, have things like that, um, you know, also. So, you know, things like that are what you would really look like. Make sure you have currency. Uh, whenever I traveled overseas, I always carried a couple of 10th ounce of gold coins with me um, because gold is a worldwide currency. So if I, you know, didn't have yen or wherever I was, um, if anything were to ever happen, everybody knows what gold is and, you know, they'll give you a, a decent value for it. So, so yeah, so things like that. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, Danny wants to know, do you have a list of your absolute number one go-to such as GPS, solar charger, batteries, etc.? cetera? Uh, Nikki is going to find, <laughs> Nikki's going to find, Nikki's just down here like, clicking away. Uh, we, I did a video on my full recharge system uh, that Nikki can link to. You can watch it. I think all the items are, are in that. So if you click on that video, uh, they're listed below. Um, I mean, I'll tell you a couple of the quick ones. So as far as a solar charger goes, I like the Goal Zero system. Um, you can get a 7, a 7 Plus, or a 14. That's just the how, how big they are. Um, I like the Goal Zero system. As far as GPS, I use Garmin and Garmin exclusively. You can get something small, compact, like a Garmin uh, E-Trex 30. You can get a larger one, like an Oregon or a Montana. Um, and then uh, as far as batteries go, you know, I use all rechargeable, like Phoenix makes uh, really good, like AA and uh, 18650 size batteries that use a micro USB to charge them. Uh, and Olight makes a CR123 rechargeable with a micro USB. So with one cable, you know, I can pretty much charge my phone, I can charge my batteries, um, and I can charge my external battery pack. So, um, so those are kind of a, some off the top of my head, but Nikki will link to that video. Um, okay, here's a great one. How do I get my wife on board with being prepared? Uh, our blackout happened, but I don't want uh, to wish for emergencies for her to get it. So this is a huge um, note to self, Nikki. Note to self. We're gonna do a, we're gonna do a whole video on this. Um, you know, there are times where your wife, a family member, could be your husband. Um, you know, kids are are kind of reluctant to get into um, 
this kind of topic. They'd rather just not not think about it. You know, if they can kind of push it out of their, their head of nothing bad is going to happen, they don't have to address it. Um, you know, one of the ways that you can start to ease people into getting prepared for things like this is do stock, stock your car. Stock your car with things. Put a little bag together, put it under the seat. You don't even have to like really tell her about it. I mean, you're not like hiding it, okay? You're not hiding it like all the guns you bought last month that you haven't told your wife about yet. Sorry, honey. Um, but put that, put that bag together. Put it under the seat. Put it in the glove box. Things like, like if you have a small child, if you have a bag that has some baby wipes in it uh, and, you know, and some snacks and just little, little things like that. And I'm telling you, guys, uh, we're going to go TMI here, but, you know, guys, if you have some, like, extra tampons and pads and stuff or toilet paper, soap, laundry detergent, dishwashing detergent, I'm not saying women are the only ones that do this, but, like, when your wife's like, ugh, we don't have any more laundry detergent, and you're like, hey, I had a little bit stored away right here. See, being prepared helps. Um, it's, little, it's little things like that that can start to ease them into it. If, if you're trying to beat them over the head of like, when the government comes and beats on our door, we got to run, it's hard for them to accept like, why is the government going to come and beat on my door and take all of our stuff? Um, but you can do little things, you know, putting little kits together. Uh, you know, there's things like, you know, when I started with my wife, it was like, honey, like, just put this small flashlight in your purse. And it only took like a week or two, and she was like, uh, she didn't want to admit it, of course, but she was like, uh, I, used, I used the flashlight when I was walking through the parking lot at work because it got dark real, uh, real early in the winter, and she was like, I, I used that flashlight. And it opened her eyes to, hey, I can carry a couple items that can be comfort items and can help me you know, if something were to happen. Um, so it's little things like that that you can start to work into their everyday kind of lives a little bit that I think helps draw them in to the understanding of, okay, you're not just preparing for like when an EMP goes off or, you know, when Russia invades America. These are just everyday things, you know, getting stuck in a traffic jam and your wife just wishing you had a bottle of water and you being able to grab one and like, here, honey, I had a case of water in the car. Here, have some water. Um, you know, things like that. Um, you know, can really help out having a snack bar for that, you know, kind of same reason. Uh, you know, I, I've, I was once stuck on the interstate for 14 hours because of a wreck. Um, it was great that I had some stuff that I could just eat and some water that I could, um, that I could have. So, you know, just little things like that. I think easing them into it is a great way, um, to start to open the conversation and to open their, their mind into, um, this kind of preparedness. So I, I hope that I hope that helps. Um, but we're going to do a further video on on getting you know family members and wives and stuff on on board with prepping. So um, all right, let's see here. I left some kind bars in the glove box. She called me uh, stuck in traffic and skipped lunch, so she was thankful. See, there you go, there you go. I just had a guy. There you go. That's that's how you do it right there. So uh, you know, his wife got stuck in a in a traffic jam, and you know, and she missed lunch, and he was able to say, "Honey, there's some kind bars in the glove box for you. So help yourself." I kind of like me some kind bars too. Uh, the honey ones are good, Nikki. The honey ones are good. Uh huh. Yeah, Nikki's done. Nikki knows. Nikki knows. Um, all right. Next question here. Where are we on time? Okay, one hour. All right. Uh, should I carry primitive fire making options in my get home bag? Uh, you know, it depends on what you consider primitive fire making. You know, if you're talking like I'm going to carry a full bow drill kit in my get home bag, uh, I would consider that a waste of space and, and weight because you could fit like 10 more pieces of more modern, uh, better fire making tools into your bag uh, in place of that, and, and they would work a whole lot better. So, you know, and the other thing with a lot of primitive fire making options is it takes a lot of skill, uh, and there's a reason why we invented new ways of starting fire. It's because they're better and easier and faster. Uh, and I'm not knocking primitive stuff. You know, we can, we can get out a bow drill and, and I can go to town with it. But, um, you know, when you find yourself in a stressful situation, the last thing you want to do is trying to find the perfect piece of wood, uh, you know, in order to, to make a bow drill. You'd rather have, you know, a lighter or a ferro rod or something like that in your hands. So, um, all right, next question. Uh, we're good to keep going, Nikki? We're good? Okay. 
All right, besides self-defense, what is the must-have for a city? Um, oh, man. You know, as far as city goes, um, it all depends on what city you're talking about. And, and I understand that I think city people get left out of the, the, the prepping community quite a bit with regards to we, we always go into the woods. I don't know, there's always woods. But when you live in a city, it's not always a chance that you can just run off into the woods and, you know, put a hammock up and, and sing Kumbaya with a campfire. Uh, you know, some of us live in cities, and that's, that's where we have to live. That's where our job is, our family. Um, you know, it, I will say that there are some things um, that I would keep in my bag, I do keep in my bag, um, that relate to a city. I would say definitely calories because you're not going to find wild edibles. There's not stuff growing there. You're not going to find animals. You're probably not going to go fishing. Make sure you have calories. Um, the other thing is, uh, I can't think of the name right now. Nikki, it's wipes to, to get rid of pepper spray um, and things. You can find it on Amazon. I have them in my bag. I just can't think of a name of them. Um, but they can help. You know, I, I believe that if, if something like an EMP is to go off, we're just going to say EMP, uh, and, and a city, the police are going to try to control the situation as much as they can for as long as they can until they throw their hands up and say, that's it, we've been overran. And how they're going to try to control crowds is going to be, you know, with, with pepper spray um, and tear gas and things like that. So, um, I, and I just can't think of the wipes names right now. But you can get them on Amazon. Uh, yeah, that's it. What are they? Um, can you tell them pepper yeah. spray wipes? Yeah. Uh, just, just Amazon pepper spray wipes. They come in like a white, a white bag. Um, but that's going to help you because the last thing you want is to just try to – you're, you're minding your own business and you get pepper spray on you. Uh, pepper spray sucks when it gets in your eyes, trust me. Um, you know, something like that to be able to wipe your face off. It is something that I keep in, in one of my longer distance bags um, just for that reason, you know. And then the, the other reason, you know, I carry it is because there, there's just going to be a lot of people, in cities and that's why a lot of people you know are, are moving to the country that's why a lot of preppers move out of the city because they want to get away from people so you got to have things uh to deter people and i think you know pepper spray on the other side is another way to deter a a, a situation um without it escalating to you know a firearm or something like that so you know those are two two suggestions that i would take there uh let's see here um yeah, you know, have have multiple routes, uh, have multiple routes planned for every every place that you go. Have multiple routes because you might, you know, the shortest distance might be over two bridges and through a main city. Um, you might have to have two alternate routes, you know. And it's also as far as routes go, it's having common uh, knowledge of of the area, um, and it's even knowing simple facts like. If, if an interstate is an even number, that means it runs east-west. If it's an odd number, it runs north-south. Uh, if, it, if it has a three-digit number, it's a loop around a city. You know, knowing small little facts like that can really help you uh, if you do find yourself in an unknown situation. You know, if you know, like, hey, 75 runs straight through these cities, so every time I see a loop, I'm going to take it. That, you know, that, that kind of information. But, yeah, always, always have multiple routes. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what is your Bob food of choice? Work 10 miles away, uh, three day trip at most lifeboat bars, MREs. Um, first of all, 10 miles away, 10 miles should be easily covered, uh, in a day. E easily, easily. You're talking five, maybe six hours of, of walking at, at a, like a literally walking pace, two miles an hour, uh, one and a half, two miles an hour. Um, so 10 miles away, I would say a small, a very small lightweight pack. Uh, make sure you have some water, especially in the summer months. Make sure you have adequate clothing. Um, but as far as my, my bug out bag, get home bag food of choice, um, I prefer, I have two different layers. So uh, I prefer dehydrated food uh, in, in my bag just because it's lighter. Um, now I need water, so that's a, an advantage that MREs have, but MREs contain water, so they're heavier. Um, I, I mostly stay away from the, the bar craze, um, you know, big 
protein bars, things like that, candy bars. Now I do have a couple Snickers bars in here because that can just make life easy. Uh, it's a morale boost. Um, but usually for me, it's, it's uh, dehydrated food because it's lightweight, it's packable. Um, and then lifeboat rations. The reason I have lifeboat rations in here is because it's huge calories condensed into a small uh, footprint. So, you know, I will go as long as I can on dehydrated food, um, but I know that I have, you know, 3,000 or 4,000 calories packed into like an SOS bar or a life rough, uh, lifeboat ration um, that can go a couple of days if I need it to. And I'll tell you some, some other, you know, fact, when I did my Go Ruck event, you know, 52 miles, um, we wore a, a monitor and stuff uh, to, to record some information. Uh, and I burned close to 8,000 calories in, in 17 hours. So, you know, you start looking at if, if, you're, if you're really moving, you know, 20 miles a day, you're burning three, 4,000 calories a day, and you're only replacing it with 1,000 calories, your body's going to run out of energy. Um, you know, and you got you to remember, your, your stomach is your fuel tank. When it runs empty, the car doesn't want to go anymore. So, um, so make sure you keep putting fuel in you so that the car keeps going. So, um, and we also have a bug out bag video. Uh, oh, Nikki, put, you put it in. Yeah. Nikki put a video link. All your whole bug yeah, bag Nikki's, so. Nikki's faster than I am at this. So he's putting things on a teleprompter. He's faster than I am at it. So, uh, <laughs> sorry, Nikki. Uh, Nikki's just better than me. So, uh, all right. What will happen and how to prepare for a major power outage lasting days or weeks? Um, okay, I guess, you know, you're talking like if you're, if you're going through, uh, I mean, we're talking get home bag situation here, so I'll kind of keep it there. Um, all right, so power outages, you know, keeping things charged up. I mean, that goes back to, you know, having a solar uh, charger on you, having an external battery. I carry an Anchor uh, 20,000 milliamp battery in my bag. Um, so I know I can keep my phone going. Um, I can charge my phone like seven, eight, nine times, I think 10 times off of, off of that. Um, as soon as you, you know, if you know it's something that's going to last days and days, you got you to gotta start power conserving as soon as you can. Uh, turning your phone on and off, using electronics only, you know, sparingly uh, to, to make sure that, that you have, you know, um, as much power as you need, but being able to get solar, you know, on it. Um, the biggest thing with power outage is people are going to, for about the first 24 hours, people are going to think that it's okay, that's happened before, it's no big deal. Um, after I would say probably 48 hours of them not getting as much information as they would like, that's when panic is going to set in. That's when people are going to panic that it's never going to get better. Uh, that's when people think that it's now is the time to take advantage, loot stores, things like that. Um, that's when, that's when I think it starts to, is going to get worse around that 72 hour mark. And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, the whole, if you can last 72 hours in a situation, you know, your, your, uh, chances of survivability start to go up. Cause I think within that 48 to 72 hour range, I think that's when you're going to start to see most of the situations start to develop. Um, and, you know, in a power outage, I think is something that is going to become more common in, in America. Uh, we're stretching our power supply, our infrastructure. I mean, it's stretched so much right now because of political situations, environmental situations. We're not able to bring power plants online as much as we want to. And it's just taxing on the system, you know. We're getting to the point where uh, I saw a post the other day, you know, New York is wanting everybody to keep their thermostats above 78 degrees because they know that their infrastructure is just on the verge. And if they have a heat wave come through and everybody cranks that AC down, uh, they're going to have power outages again. So, um, you know, so things like that, uh, you just got to prepare for it in your bag. If you're a, not a solar charger kind of guy, Make sure you got batteries in there. Uh, try to keep electronics as common as possible as far as sales go. Uh, I know it's not possible. Just 
the day, I, like I wish everything took a AA battery. I wish, you know, or a CR123 or whatever your, your battery might be. Um, but we're not at that so, stage for the most part. So, you know, making sure you have batteries in there for, for everything. Um, <laughs> this guy said, since you're very organized. Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Uh, do you keep a printout spreadsheet of your pack? Uh, on your PC or on your phone with bag complete inventory lists, and if you do, easily reference it. Uh, what do you have? Okay, so what I do is I have a folder at home. Um, all my bags are kind of mentally numbered. I don't have like a one or a two on it, but I have a list of all the bags, um, and each bag has contents that are in it. Now, the difference, one of the differences between me, I don't have a, uh, a ton of bags that just lay around dormant for a long time. Uh, the amount of classes that like Nikki and Chris and Alan and I go to and do, the amount of times we go out and shoot videos for you guys, uh, I kind of live out of this bag a little bit. So like food, like this is, uh, if you were to call me up and say we're going to the woods today, this is the bag I grab, we can leave in five minutes. Um, so this food gets rotated quite often, so I don't really have to ever worry about the food. Now I have a, a, a stove in here, so like there's times where uh, Nikki and I went out the other day and I grabbed the canister out, I was going to heat up some water and I was like, ooh, this thing's almost empty. Um, so use a dating system. I have a Sharpie, uh, I have a Sharpie marker that I keep in here. It's not really for like, oh, I'm leaving my loved ones a note or I'm telling people where I'm going. Uh, I keep the Sharpie marker in here because I can write on pretty much anything while we're out in the woods. Um, but I keep it on here so I can write dates of like how much I use things or when I used it or when I put it in there. So that when I'm looking through my bag, I'm like, ooh, that's, you know, that's six months old, that's eight months old or whatever. And, and I can kind of go from there. Um, I just use Excel. That's it. I just punch it in. I, I, I don't use any fancy apps or anything. I run an Excel spreadsheet. I print it out. I put it in the folder. Uh, and that and that's pretty much it. So um, so this is my this is my kind of my grab bag that I grab most of the time. Uh, and then I have another bag that's like my experimental bag, I would say. It's new products that I'm trying, new new gear that we're testing, uh, things that I think might work that I'll grab every now and then, and that's just a hodgepodge of stuff. So um, so that's the only kind of time it circulates. It might go from that bag because I love it. It goes into this bag and, and so forth. So um, bit off topic. Okay, this is, the, sorry, I'm reading the question. Bit off topic, but how about a video about uh, flashlight tents, given these cheap LEDs are out there? Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, China has made a lot of things in, in electronics affordable. You know, I was at Lowe's the other day and you can get, and Nikki and I have, have tested them a little bit. You can get like LED flashlights for like three bucks uh, and they don't work that bad, you know. It's all just kind of how do you want it to fit into your system and how much do you want to rely on that kind of thing, you know. Um, Olight makes extremely affordable lights. Phoenix makes extremely affordable lights. Um, you know, there's a lot of companies out there that, that make really high, what I would consider high quality lights that are very affordable. Um, and I would lean towards that, you know, and then there's really, really cheap ones. Now, I have really, really cheap ones. Um, I have a, a box in my house that I consider it my give, my give out box. I give the items out of it. So if the power goes out, I got an old lady that lives next door to me. Um, you know, power went out a, a couple months ago and I went over and checked on her and she didn't have any flashlights. So like I gave her like, a, you know, one of those $4 LED lights and she loved it. And I was like, you can just keep it. Uh, but it didn't take away from what my family needed. So, you know, things like that. Yeah, $4 light is, is perfect. Um, all right, Donovan asks, uh, what about medication? Medication. Medication is very much overlooked when it comes to a, a get home bag. Um, if you, if you have like high blood pressure, uh, if you have heart issues, if you have, you know, seizures, uh, medications that you have, if you're extremely allergic to, to like bees or any type of outdoor stuff and you have to carry an EpiPen, those have to be, it's, it's crucial, have to be in your get home bag. Um, now they can, you know, heat can cause issues. If this is something you leave in your car, you got to rotate them consistently. Um, I would say even do it monthly, just take them out. Um, like what I do, 
you know, with medications that we have in our house, uh, I've told you guys before, my wife has to take anti-seizure medication. Uh, every single month, we have another bottle in the medicine cabinet. I take the old bottle out. That's what she uses, and the new bottle goes in there. So it's in a constant rotation. you got to do the same with your bag. Um, and once again, if we're talking a get-home bag, you should know the mileage in which you're going with, um, and you should have medication for that set distance. So if you consider it just a one-day trip, have medication for one day. If it's a 10-day trip that you're thinking it's going to take you to get home because you're 300 miles away, make sure you have 10 days of medication. Also, make sure you have ibuprofen and Tylenol in there uh, because you can take them um, you can take them in, in, in rotating doses. It's going to help with inflammation. It's going to help with knees and pain and, you know, muscles and things like that. Um, so make sure you have both of those in there. Um, make sure you have anti-diarrheal medicine in your bag. If you get some bad water or bad food, something like that, um, and, and I'm talking even if it wasn't a, a situation, you're just away from home. Uh, if you cannot get off the toilet, you cannot get yourself to a Walgreens to get anti-diarrheal medicine without it being a disgusting uh, situation. So whenever I, like, whenever I travel, my backpack, I always have anti-diarrheal medicine in my EDC pack. Uh, I carried it, and this is something that I learned. I was overseas, uh, ate or drank something that I should not have, and I found myself in a hotel room trying to figure out you know, how to stay hydrated. My hands and my arms were cramping. And the only, issue, uh, the only solution that I had at that point was to continuously drink the water out of the hotel faucet, um, hoping that that wasn't the source that got me sick to begin with. Because you know, I, couldn't, I couldn't call for help. There was no help. Nobody's going to help me. They don't understand me. Um, so anti-diarrheal medicine, I, I would say, is definitely something that has to be in there as well. So, um, okay, how would you keep insulin? Um, insulin is, is extremely um, difficult due to the fact that it needs to be kept cold. What I would suggest is, um, I know some people, you can buy small um, DC refrigerators pretty much. I mean, they're small though. They're made to keep like soda cans cold. You can keep those in your car, keep them plugged into the cigarette lighter and keep the insulin in there. I've seen some people do that. Um, you can go old school with just, you know, um, ice bricks or ice in a, in a ice chest in the back of your car. Um, get, you know. And this is where we have to start talking about the, um, the expense side of things. You know, at that point, if it's a situation where you have to keep insulin cool, man, invest in a fantastic cooler, you know. I, I hate the fact that Yeti coolers are so expensive, but go get an Arctic one or, or you know, something that will keep ice cold as long as possible because that's what you're going to rely on. Um, but I've seen a lot of people use you know, the, the DC powered you know, in their car and things like that to, to keep insulin going. Um, let's see here. Oh, okay, Lisa asked, um, Chris and I are in the process. We are working on a, on a, a, a personal signal kit that includes a signal panel, signal mirror, um, and some Kim lights and things like that. It's a real small kit. Um, it's, it's in the process. We are, we are working on it, Lisa, uh, and we'll definitely let you guys know uh, when it's available. You know, it's a kit that I keep in my bag. Uh, it's from another company that's been out of business for a lot of years. We're taking that design. We're, we're tweaking it. Some of the things that, that I've wanted to do for quite a while with it, um, but it's a really good kit. But yes, Lisa, we will definitely keep you uh, informed on that. So, um, all right, it's been about an hour and a half. I'll answer just a couple more questions here. So if you've got just any more questions, ask them real quick. Uh, if you guys haven't already, make sure you check out our Survival Dispatch Insider. We have an entire issue on get home bags um, that you know every single month uh, what we do, we don't have a Patreon, we don't ask for donations, uh, we have the Insider. The Insider is $9.95 a month. Every single month we do a uh, magazine editorial PDF that you can download, you can print it out, you can save it on your computer, and it's just a resource library. And uh, every single issue is, you know, right around 70, 80, sometimes 100 pages long on just one topic. So it's, it's fantastic uh, layout. It's mind-blowing. It rivals anything that's on the newsstand. Um, 
but it's one of those things where we made it to where it becomes a resource library. When you put them all together, uh, you know, if you need information on a Get Home Bag, you go to the Get Home Bag issue. Uh, we have 22 issues out right now, um, and you can check it out for free for 14 days. You can check out all 22 issues if you would like. Um, and then we have tons of things like a private Facebook page that you can get in and ask more questions like this on stuff. Um, all kinds of bug out bag blueprints and um, scheduling and things like that. So check out link below insider. Uh, survivaldispatch.com if you want to go to the URL and uh, you know it's free for 14 days and then 995 and that's how you support all of this um, so um, you know so that's that's what we do and there's and I want to say too there's zero ads in it we don't take out any ad advertisement we don't take any ad money uh, it's just 70 80 pages of information so we got rid of all that we even got rid of the crappy magazine inserts that drive everybody crazy there's none of those so you don't have to rip them out and throw them away so um, all right, next, uh, we got a couple more questions here. So, uh, powder drink mix. Yeah, electrolytes are extremely important. Um, I always keep, um, uh, what I like is uh, Gatorade. Gatorade is, is kind of hard for me. Um, it, it's hard on my stomach. It doesn't settle with me well. Um, I use a, a drink called, it's called Windtail. And uh, the difference is it actually has like 200 calories in it also. So it has calories. Uh, it's made for like ultra marathon runners and things like that. Um, so that you don't get stomach bloat and um, it, it still tastes good. But you know, when you start sweating, especially summer months, things like that, you're gonna need electrolytes, you're gonna need salts. Um, so definitely have, have drink mix in there. Um, to go along with your water. Also, if you are trying to save weight or you just like using like iodine uh, or tablets to purify your water, the water can still taste gross. It can kind of taste bleachy at times. Um, so having powdered drinks, even if you're just putting like a little bit in it to get rid of that taste can really help. Um, so that's another thing that I try to use powdered mixes for. And just to to give your, your body and your mouth some flavor at times. Uh, so, um, so, I mean, things like that are, are, are definitely, you know, must haves in there cause you're gonna, you're gonna need it. So, um, do, 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 do. let's see here. Uh, um, Michael, you asked about chlorine makers. It, it, describe that just a little bit and I'll, I'll try to answer that question. So guys, make sure you also give this video a thumbs up so that others see it, so that the word gets spread that we're awesome. So uh, make sure you hit the thumbs up. Also, uh, click the link below. Nikki's gonna be putting it up there now. We are doing a bug out bag giveaway. It's uh, right here. Ugh. So if you're like, hey, I need a get home bag or a bug out bag, I don't know where to start. We are giving away a Maxpedition Falcon 2. This is kind of like the gold standard of most people's uh, get home bags. And uh, it's fantastic. This thing's built like a tank. And we're going to load it up with a bunch of stuff so that you are ready to go. So click the link. Uh, it costs you absolutely nothing. And you get to win it in a chance to win this awesome bag. So, um, so yeah. So I think we'll end on that. Uh, if you guys got any other questions, leave them below. We'll be around for the next couple of days. We'll definitely answer them. Uh, if you guys like this video, like I said, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Make sure you hit the notifications so that you don't miss out on any of our lives that we do weekly. Chris will be back here next week joining me. And uh, we're also going to have some special guests that we have lined up. So, so that'll be cool. And, uh, you know, I love the fact that you guys come. Uh, you guys are the reason we keep doing what we're doing. And uh, we appreciate all of you. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. And until next time, be safe.